It was a dark and stormy night when you heard it. The thing that goes bump in the night. But you probably don't know where it comes from. So, we're going to tell you that today. Hello, uh, I'm your lecturer, Lucas, and with me today is... Your lecturer, Tina. And we're going to answer the tough question of Gothic. Where did it come from exactly? So, if we start at the beginning of this, you might be thinking... Well, as my teachers have taught me, the most important thing to do is always look at where the word comes from. And that would be right. So if we start by looking at the history of the Gothic, you probably, we, we live in Germany, so we might know the word. Gothic comes from the Goths, a group of people, uh, tribes that had lived in southern Scandinavia, and that was their name. Most primarily people know the Visigoths as being a group of Gothic people that frequently conflicted with the Roman Empire, especially around the time of 150 to 200. But that doesn't really seem to make it clear what exactly that has to do with literature. This was, we, we aren't reading Gothic literature written by the Visigoths. That would be odd. At least it would be odd in the Anglophone context. <laughs> Some people might wonder the question, is this arbitrary? Like, so we're not reading stuff written by the Gothics. Why would we even call it that? And Roberts, uh, who is a great source on the origins of the Gothic, he talks about Proto-Germanic and how originally, you know, Gothic is derived from the word goiton, which I've just pronounced perfectly, which means to pour or to flow. And uh, Gothic literature, like a flowing river or something like that, has demonstrated a restless fluidity of genre, a fluidity of its own malleability. It can change very well, quite a lot, as you're going to find out today. When I, when I originally made this slide, I actually showed it to Tina, and she was like, but Lucas, <laughs> it is about the Goss. There is architecture. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what I said, and then you said, refer to the next slide, which we're just yeah, doing. So Boom, there it is. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> scholars do focus on the connection between Gothic architecture and the Gothic novel. And I was going to say something, but I thought Tina said it pretty well herself. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, as you know, it's connected to the Gothic architecture, and you may know that Gothic architecture is something that came up in the Middle Ages. Now, the Gothic novel, at the very least in its early uh, incarnations, quite frequently included medieval elements. And that was because it was trying to set the the stories that were gothic in a past that was distant, that could be both romanticized and stylized as dangerous, threatening, somewhat other. Because, of course, in the Middle Ages, there was also um, the Catholic Church, which had a lot more power than it did when uh, the gothic novel was first established, at least in England, because you know, they weren't Catholics anymore. And I think that's a great point. It's important to know that, like, to the people who lived when the Gothic novel came into being, these Gothic castles were material aspects and reflections of this past reality that they could see, that they could experience, and whether they were ruined or still maintained, they did represent not only exactly just this idea of the Gothic, but also became affiliative with the idea of older ideas. And you'll see why that matters later on when, when Tina explores it further. I shouldn't spoil anything. One thing that uh, was really well pointed out by Dr. Katrina Altons, who is going to be doing your session or video, maybe you've already seen it, on the Australian Gothic, is that it's also named as Gothic literature because of the mechanism of othering that is used to explore a variety of contested ideas. And that kind of connects to what I said with the architecture just now a little bit, right? If we think of Gothic as these old ideas or like an old order of ideas, and we think about the time period where this is being write, written in the 1700s, and that's a, it's quite, a, quite an interesting time in European history, at least. There's a lot going on and new discoveries are being made uh, in scientific fields, but also in philosophical fields. And because of that, there's so much in the milieu uh, the Gothic explores that by reflecting often on this Gothic kind of past. I would be at a loss if I didn't start with 
a talk about the castle of Otranto. And it's not this one. <laughs> <laughs> the castle of Otranto is probably not the first Gothic book. I'm just going to say that honestly right now. But it is the book that codifies this as a genre. The Castle of Otranto, which was written in 1764, wow, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, it is quite an interesting book because of what it explores. It doesn't explore any new ideas, per se, but it takes this assembly of different ideas uh, and arranges them, composes them in a way together through its tropes, through its different characters, many of which we're familiar with and we'll talk about even more later, but some of which I think are important to highlight the dark, scary castle. As you can see in this picture, we have uh, nobility. We have a representation of this sort of lineage to the past with tapestries literally on this picture. And this is actually a picture from a 1790s version of it. And one of the most important parts is that we have the ideas of, of lineages coming together with ideas of religious orders, with ideas of this surprise uh, child, bastard child, and things like that, all coming around and coming together to create the first Gothic novel. And I'm sure you all have heard of it, definitely, right? <laughs> and maybe even read it. No? So why not? I don't get it. If, it, if it's the most Gothic kind of novel, why, why didn't everybody like it? Or, well, people might have liked it contemporarily, but... If we think about the novel itself, he, he talks about how he pulled it from Shakespeare. He pulled it from Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, some of the ideas that he brings together in this new and creative way. But we don't really hear very much about it today, and I, I don't understand. Why is that? Maybe you already gave your own answer. It is quite an old novel, and I'm not sure that it would seem as creepy and scary today as it did when it was first written that's and... true it's not scary <laughs> at all <laughs> there we go and but if we read gothic novels then we want to be scared that's what we want we want to be titillated we want to read something that makes us at least go a little bit oh that was scary we want to have this thing that goes bump in the night and i'll get back to that in a moment when i talk about the sublime but first, I would just like to introduce you to the idea that what we've been talking about is really not the Gothic in general, but the European Gothic. Now, we've been talking about the origins of the Gothic novel, and certainly those lie in 18th century England. Uh, if we talk about the Gothic novel as a fixed genre, then it relates back to all these different new revelations, new discoveries in the 18th century that were then fighting with older ideas and that sort of brought about the genre of the Gothic. Um, but that's not always the same thing. If you look at this quote by Fred Botting, he talks about how Gothic atmospheres are gloomy and mysterious. They are evoking emotions of terror, for example. But the things we find scary are not the same all around the world. Um, if you look at the pictures there, I've got a creepy forest full of fog. That, that would be something that might be scary for a European person. And in the lower corner, I've got a cornfield. I've heard that's, that's creepy, at least to some Americans. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there, are, There's a whole tradition of corn mazes uh, that is quite prevalent in the U.S., I'm, I'm not sure about here, but uh, during Halloween time, children will sometimes go into these corn mazes. Those ones are a bit more low-key. Uh, but for some people, this is the true scariest thing because it's hard to tell which direction you go in a cornfield. Or at least that's the idea. Very similar to fog, if you think about it. Absolutely. So the way forward is sort of prevented. It's disturbed in a way. And you can't see ahead. So there's a lot of unknown that is ahead of you. And those are, I think, probably Gothic ideas that are pretty widespread that we can see in different cultures. But that's, that's exactly what I'm, you know, trying to, to explain here. The Gothic may be something that we all have in common. We probably all want to be scared at some points. 
but the things that scare us are different. And so there are distinct and important modes of Gothic that may be associated with a variety of European literatures, but there's also uh, Japanese Gothic, which, of course, we're not going to talk about here because we're talking about Anglophone Gothic mostly. Still, there's, there's a distinct national context to various Gothic tropes. And with the European Gothic, we can connect it back to the phenomenon of graveyard poetry, which stems from the 18th century in England. We can see a sort of movement from England to the continent and back. We have a cross-fertilization uh, where structure, style, setting and themes are sort of shared between different European nations. There's the idea that, you know, the, the fashion to write in a Gothic way uh, comes from England to the continent, and then ideas from Eastern Europe, such as the undead or the vampire, come back to England, and then further on to Ireland and America. So we can talk about general Gothic ideas, but we can also talk about the Gothic in the context of national traditions. There is an Irish Gothic, a Scottish Gothic, I've already mentioned the Japanese Gothic, and you may have seen examples of that in movies such as The Ring. There are even cultural gothics to consider. Some people have explored Aboriginal Gothic or Native American Gothic, First Nation Gothic. It isn't necessarily linked just to national tradition or a nation state, mm -hmm. but rather there can be a whole assemblage of traditions in the Gothic, which we will get into, I think, more. I think so. <laughs> so what we're basically saying is there are different versions of the Gothic. Now, Lucas already hinted at this idea of dualistic clashes. Within the Gothic, there's this idea of, of competing ideas, competing concepts. We've got the supernatural that is juxtaposed to reality, to the natural. We've got mysticism juxtaposed to materialism, religion and science, death versus life, which is possibly the most uh, universal one of these. We also have ideas that, you know, uh, counter you know, freedom with hierarchy. A lot of Gothic novels are set in feudal societies. We've got a lot of kings and lords and so on in the Gothic novel, even though in the 18th century, as Lucas has also already hinted at, we've got uh, several movements that go away from this absolutism, like the French Revolution, for example. Um, there's also the idea uh, that the Gothic deals with the contrast between a repressed sexuality and sexual desire. If you think of the vampire, for example, that is a figure that repels us, but it also attracts. Or if you think about the, the werewolf, you can also make a similar, comp uh, I guess, comparison in that these are creatures who suddenly become more wild in a, in a sexually erotic sort of way in the night. Yes. Although I think the vampire is, is the strongest example. Uh, absolutely, but that isn't how he started off, the vampire, I mean. Uh, in the original folklore about the vampire, he was just, you know, in, a completely gruesome and, and disgusting undead creature that would just suck you dry and was probably rotting already, so nothing, nothing like Edward Cullen or my personal favourites, and Rice's vampires. No. It just wasn't. I think the idea of an attractive vampire figure probably stems from Dracula. Dracula is certainly a threatening figure, and he's not as sexy and appealing as not modern vampires are. But the idea that he can be attractive, that the vampire can be attractive, very much starts with Bram Stoker's Dracula. And maybe that's a gothic novel that we all know more about, right? If we think about Dracula, or if we think about Shelley's Frankenstein, or if we think about even Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, maybe. Uh, there's a variety yes. of, of popular European Gothic novels that we can highlight as being part of this struggle of ideas. Jekyll and Hyde being maybe a little bit on the nose. <laughs> I was about to say that. Jekyll and Hyde, of course, includes the figure of the double, which is the personification of this idea of two struggling sides. Before we go a bit further into various tropes of the European Gothic and eventually the Gothic in general, I would like to introduce to you 
a concept that is called the sublime. Now, the sublime was, it stems from, from long ago, from a Roman historian Longinus, but the, in the form that we are talking about here, uh, which becomes relevant for the Gothic novel, it was described by Edmund Burke in his 1757 treatise, An Inquiry into the Nature of the Beauty and the Sublime. If you look at the quote up here, uh, Botting says that the Gothic signified a trend towards an aesthetics based on feeling and emotion and associated primarily with the sublime. So clearly the sublime is an idea that is intricately connected to the Gothic. Now, what does Burke say about the sublime? The passion caused by the great and sublime in nature when those causes operate most powerfully is astonishment. And astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. In this case, the mind is so entirely filled with its object that it cannot entertain any other, nor by consequence reason on that object which employs it. So what this means is, if we look at the sublime, we are looking at something that is so vast and grandiose, but also threatening, that we can't quite grasp it. Now, if you look at the pictures here, one of them is a romantic image by Caspar David Friedrich, uh, Der Wanderer über dem Nebelmeer, or The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. And that sort of, in a way, exemplifies ideas of the sublime. We've got the solitary human figure looking out onto the landscape. And the other picture is a contemporary photo. We've got a wanderer just looking at the enormity of nature, at the, the, the astonishment that he derives from that, the sublime. And on the next slide, I've got images that are basically the same. We've got the human figure that is dwarfed by the environment, that looks at nature and has just has to admit that it's nothing against it. So it's this kind of, of feeling that the sublime de describes. Looking at something that is much bigger than you, that could crush you or kill you in any way possible, but you sort of, you're removed from it. So you're still, you're safe enough to enjoy this feeling of danger, to enjoy this feeling of terror. And that is exactly what, what Berg talks about. We can look at these dangerous things. We can look at ideas of pain and danger. We can contemplate them, but from a distance. And here we can see the connection to the Gothic, right? We've already talked about how the Gothic always situates or often situates its stories in the distant past or in another country. And so we can read it and we can be pleasantly creeped out. And I would say that that is something that is still with us. That's something that we still crave. That's why we look, that's why we see, we watch horror movies or we read Stephen King. We want to be scared. And in a way, the sublime has never really left us. If you look at this picture here, it's, a, it's an image of our galaxy with the tiny, tiny, tiny little point that is the Earth. And you are here, it says. And that, that fills you with terror in a way, right? And I mean, that is, in a way, also one of the ways that the Gothic connects so well to other genres like science fiction is through notions of the sublime. True astonishment. Astonishment when one character steps through the portal <laughs> into that portal quest fantasy. Yes. Astonishment when a new planet is discovered or a black hole brings uh, the spaceship into a different time or universe. Absolutely. So I would say that the sublime is certainly one of those transformative and genre-crossing aspects of the Gothic mode. Yes, thank you. Very good. And because we just addressed that, why don't we have a look at the tropes that make up the Gothic and that may also translate to other genres which are then written in the Gothic mode? What do we have? We've got spectres, monsters, demons, corpses, skeletons, evil aristocrats, monks and nuns. I, I quite like this juxtaposition here that Botting makes between demons, corpses, but also evil aristocrats. There's probably something that we can read from that. Fainting heroines and bandits populate gothic landscapes as, a suge as suggestive figures of imagined and realistic threats. 
And then this list grows in the 19th century. We've got scientists, Frankenstein, anyone? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We've got bad fathers, husbands, madmen, criminals. That actually makes me think of the Sherlock Holmes stories, which probably contain quite a lot of gothic elements as well. Oh, we've got the monstrous double, as in the previously mentioned Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but also the picture of Dorian Gray, and that usually signifies duplicity and evil nature. What about the landscapes? Well, I mean, gothic landscapes are, are what? They're desolate, they're big, they're full of menace, and they also can be really closed as well. In the 18th century, Botting says they were wild and mountainous locations. And then in the modern city, they combined the natural and architectural components of Gothic grandeur, grandeur, whoops, and <laughs> wilderness. It's dark, labyrinthine streets suggesting the violence and menace of Gothic castle and forest. But I want to add a little addendum to this. It's important to know that the Gothic is both what is big and vast and what is imprisoning and confining. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really have any normal hallways in a gothic castle we either have the biggest hallway you've ever seen or the smallest one or we've got secret passageways which are usually also quite small exactly and that again shows the dualistic nature of the gothic right now we've already talked about how the major uh, setting of the gothic used to be the castle then it became uh the city we've got whole books on the urban gothic again dr jekyll and mr hyde i keep mentioning that novel uh it's also based in edinburgh which is probably why i like it so much and in recent days we also have uh the haunted house which is still a very very popular trope not only in in novels but also in films what we frequently also have according to botting is passion excitement and sensation that transgresses what is socially proper that transgress moral laws. We've got ambivalence and uncertainty, and we also have the Gothic drawing on myths and legends and folklore. And Botting here says of medieval romances, but I would argue that the wider, the more, more global Gothic also draws on other sources, on other myths and legends. And I mean, when you're drawing on, on these other myths and legends, I think that really segues well into the idea of gothic that is not just european because the gothic as we said travels and transfers and changes i also just wanted to point out that while we did mention a list of tropes we even looked at a list of tropes on tv tropes because there are just so many things that are gothic and if we wanted to we could just go da 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 da, -da. we could read that all day because there are so many things there mm -hmm. in the gothic this is not an exhaustive list of tropes but it's pretty dang good now, new tropes arise, and they move back and forth, right? So if vampires arise in Eastern Europe, they will come back to the European Gothic, and the same thing is going to be true for post-colonial Gothic. Why is that important? Well, when we read soon, maybe you'll have some opinions about that. Maybe <laughs> that's a traveling back kind of story. Maybe it's not very Australian. It depends on your opinion. Now, when it comes to uh, post-colonial Gothics, I want to put a little asterisk already there. I'm putting the post in parentheses because I'm talking a bit about America here, and I don't want to offend any post-colonial scholars who might pull out their pitchforks on me if I call America post-colonial. The reason that we're going to talk about America for a moment is because American literature, like Australian and Canadian literature, has had strong influences on the Gothic, but I would think, and I would argue, and I, I think Tina would agree, that the American influence is probably the most noteworthy so far. Mm-hmm. And this is because, especially in literature. Outside of literature, I think it's a bit more tenuous ground. But if we're talking about Anglophone literature, the American Gothic has a lot of stuff it does. You probably have heard of the big three, as I like to think of them. Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and H.P. Lovecraft. I'm hoping you know at least two, and I'm hoping you've read all three. All three of them explore different thematic concerns with their, their Gothic literature. Their gothic literature is thematic more so than just trying to scare you. It's also wrapped up in something bigger. I'm not saying earlier gothic wasn't as well. We can certainly say that with Jekyll and Hyde. But <laughs> the recurrent themes in, in the American gothic are things like madness, race, and cosmic threats. And these are some things that have become extremely popular in horror fiction today. You might say, oh, looks like the gothic might be around there. <laughs> 
And I, I think that's a, a, a fair point. Certainly, if we look at some recent films that were very popular, both Get Out and This Is Us from the same director even, they explore both madness and race in quite effective ways, and I think they would call, we would call them very gothic. Uh, Lucas, I think the movie's called Us, and This Is Us is a oh, yes. feel-good <laughs> TV show, as far uh-huh. as I know. Correct. <laughs> but we also see the double, so we've got the more traditional European gothic coming in as well. Very, very good point. And we also have a literary example in Stephen King that I think is great as well. Certainly all of his stuff would be called horror, fantasy, thriller, depending on what it is. But almost all of his work has gothic undertones or gothic aesthetic energy and tropes being put into its use. The American Gothic is particularly noteworthy not because of these thematic concerns, though, but because of the sort of subgenres that it's created. We've kind of got a New England style of Gothic that's very Lovecraftian, if you've ever heard that before. Uh, And we've also got a Southern type of Gothic, if we think about writers like William Faulkner, where the castle becomes the plantation. If we wanted to talk about the Australian Gothic, though, that's not this video. I'm sorry. (laughs) So I'm just going to say here that we're going to give that, we're going to pass that over to Dr. Katrina Alton. She's an expert at it. She's going to do a great job, I'm sure. We don't want any spoilers, do we? But one thing I will say is a little bit of common ground that might be out there. So some common elements that I would say exist in post-colonial Gothic, and certainly a variety of sources agree, is that the frontier is one of the areas or spaces that's different that we see in this Gothic versus the European Gothic. A lot of the European Gothic is a familiar world. Um, We take a familiar thing like a castle and we defamiliarize it. In the sense of the frontier, we have an unfamiliar thing that's already unfamiliar. And we can see examples of that in the U.S. with Appalachia, Australia with the bush, northern Canada with Canada, and the list goes on. Ghosts are also more prominent not just as a a concept of like a spirit, but as a ghost of a past due to some grievance that has been inflicted upon someone or something. And that's very much, I would say, normal in colonial writing as well. And I think here we have the idea of the haunting, right? That can refer to actual literal ghosts in a story, but also traumatic past, as you said, that haunts the present. Yeah, and I mean, if we if we want to if we wanted to roll the zombie trope into the gothic, which we maybe could, <laughs> go look at the zombies video. I think it might relate to this a little bit. But this idea of something in the past returning or coming again in response to today's events is par for the course. It's normal. The unknown is something I would also like to highlight, but the unknown is already pretty important to the gothic. I just want to say it's even more important here. This is getting even more emphasis. And I think if we look back at the slide that I had up on different kinds of gothics from different locations, when we talked about how different things can be scary, Lucas correctly pointed out that the European fog and the American cornfield both restrict vision in a way. And so they make the unknown even more unknowable because you literally can't see it. So I think that's that's probably relevant here. So you might be like, well, I've listened to the podcast and I noticed that Lucas keeps saying everything is gothic. And the other people, they, they aren't seeming like they aren't mad at him about it. They seem to be like, well, kind of. So is everything gothic? Well... That's a good question. Is everything gothic or is nothing gothic anymore? Because if you read some of the scholars of the gothic, they will tell you that the gothic novel has gone out of fashion. And I don't think that's strictly speaking true. We've got novels such as Soon, which we're reading for this course. We've got Stephen King's novels, and they all certainly have gothic elements to them. And they sell. They sell, absolutely. Because If you refer back to what I said about the sublime, we still want to be scared. We want to be scared shitless sometimes, and that's what the gothic does. But it can do it in a variety of novels, and that's when the gothic genre becomes the gothic mode. Before we get into the the gothic mode, I I do just want to say the gothic was a genre for sure. (laughs) That's something we can kind of pin down historically. We can say it was a literary genre, marketed as such, alive as such, understood as such theorized about as such, Uh, but maybe that time is, is long gone now. 
Mm -hmm. I certainly agree that there was a definitive point in time where we had the gothic novel and that had a very clearly defined set of features. It, it was a genre, definitely. Well, what scholars like Alistair Fowler would say is that the gothic romance or the gothic novel then yielded something called a gothic mode and that outlasted it and it was applied to a wide variety of different genres and Fowler here cites the maritime adventure, the psychological novel, the crime novel, the short story, the film script and various science fiction subgenres and here again we can probably think of, of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein which sort of combines both. I think I have a pretty good quote for this and it's from Agnieszka Monet. As the current global surge of interest in all things gothic has revealed, the gothic is actually much more than a literary genre. It is an aesthetic, or a mode, that can invest almost any medium or aesthetic form. Visual art, photography, video games, fashion, cinema, and a variety of literary forms, including nonfiction. The gothic is generally thought to have started with Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, but... Walpole merely brought together a set of influences that were already permeating landscape architecture, poetry, and aesthetic philosophy, and gave them a clear name and a distinctly modern stamp, ironically by pretending to be anachronistic. So that, that's, I think, a very nice quote. And if I had to choose one quote from this video that I would describe as the central one, it would probably be this. It has the past of the Gothic as a novel genre, it's got the development into a mode. It sort of tells you what a mode is. It's an aesthetic that can permeate very different genres. And we also have the reference to the Castle of Otranto, which we probably should all read. But what's also very interesting is that while the Gothic mode can be applied to very different genres, I would argue that there's a certain kind of genre that is contemporary, or that are contemporary, because there's more than one, which are possibly more closely aligned or associated with the Gothic. What do you think about that, Lucas? I mean, if we think about genres that have truly the strongest relationship, I think we can look at what genres came out of the Gothic. Mm -hmm. So at least in the, in the tradition of scaring people, we have horror. We also have detective mysteries because they are about horror that has transpired a horror that we react to and we reestablish or we solve uh, in some way so noir is a great example because the aesthetic of noir is also all about creating a sense of mystery and shock and surprise and it also has a lot of the very standard european conventions and tropes from the gothic being reintroduced in a slightly new way and if we think about the american new england gothic Cosmic horror is that genre, and soon is a piece of cosmic horror, one could say. Supernatural tales are another obvious pick, right? I think, generally speaking, if we look at something like Twilight, mm -hmm. to me at least it's very clear that novels that involve vampires, werewolves, and demons do have some relation to the genre that was all about vampires, werewolves, and demons. <laughs> what, what a... What a... <laughs> What a revelation, Lucas. I think nobody would have connected those two. It still needed to be said. <laughs> you're right, you're right. And I think what probably distinguishes them is that especially the vampire and the werewolf have taken on uh, positive features in supernatural tales. So they're less, they've become less scary. At least I'm, I'm not particularly scared by a vampire that starts glittering in the sunlight. Still, it's very definitely the vampire. It's a supernatural tale, and it does have a couple of gothic tropes. Edward Cullen alone, he's a Byronic hero, maybe? He's certainly he's yes. sullen and you know moody and that type of thing. Another thing we have is ghost stories. Now, those, I would say, predate uh, the gothic. That's something... That has probably always been around and in all cultures. Personally, I can think of collections of Japanese ghost stories, but also Chinese ghost stories and probably from all around the world. 
there there seems there just seems to be something about the ghost that has always fascinated us and probably always will and quite a few of these can be described as gothic or as being written in the gothic mode now of course we could also turn to more modern examples i think our last four little little things here i should say last two are all more contemporary in in their focus and i think that's maybe where the most obvious associations will emerge uh and the kind of heritage of of some of these other modes or genres being combined like if we think of urban legends they usually are mystery they are noir in some sense but they're also supernatural tales they're like this hybrid genre that is very unique but it is pulling on the same gothic materials from these earlier genres and the prior gothic mode and genre. And I didn't put creepypasta here, so why don't you explain that, Tina? Well, creepypasta, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be an expert, but it's little pieces of fiction that are posted on the internet, most often under the pretense of being real. And it very much appeals to the sort of let's say, a gothic readership, a readership that expects something gothic, especially with this pretends to be real, because that then refers back to the frame narrative of the gothic, uh, where we would have the found manuscript, or in movies nowadays, the found footage, where it sort of tells you, well, this is not me just telling a story, this is me reading this manuscript that I found that is historical rather than fictional. And so it's got this, this sort of frame narrative not being explicitly stated but just being there because it is being posted on these websites where it's uh, represented as something that really happened yeah and, and creepypasta in particular is pretty interesting because it has so many different uh medial uh, uh, figurations we can find it uh, on twitter we can find Chris creepypasta in youtube mm -hmm. series uh i i actually really like reading and watching some creepypasta sometimes and I think that it definitely takes on the gothic elements from time to time. Yep, I agree. Uh, there's some creepypasta that is on really old blog websites where you can you you can sort of see they were written in the 90s, but they're still they're you know they're gripping. They're telling you this this gothic tale of of how you burrow into the ground, and so we've got the enclosed the enclosed location, and then you're faced with something that attacks you from below and there we have the cosmic horror so i think yeah that's that's a very uh, good contender for the gothic successor definitely and i made some modifications to this slide and i wanted to mention gaslamp fantasy in particular although i haven't read much of it it's very much out there and i definitely think it's a type of the gothic mode because it really tends to highlight certain gothic conventions and one of the most obvious is, well, you guessed it, gas lamps don't tend to light very well. So the darkness in itself is a very important part of its aesthetic character. And of course, adjacent to gas lamp fantasy is that punk subgenre, which I think is very definitely, debatably at least, usually utilizing the gothic mode. Punk fiction, whether steampunk, diesel punk, or cyberpunk, often seems to lean on gothic conventions, but not enough has really been said about it, at least not in popular gothic readers and texts. I suggest keeping an eye on it. Yeah, so uh, basically what we're saying is the gothic is still alive and kicking, and we can see it as a mode almost everywhere. I think before we now let you go on to watch maybe Catherine's video, or I don't know, do your assignments, Maybe we can just sum up what we did today. We started with the etymological origins of the Gothic. We gave you a little bit of an overview of the historic origins of the genre of the Gothic novel, which is, you know, based in 18th century England. And so that led us to talk about the European Gothic. We talked about the sublime. Uh, we talked about uh, some tropes and then... We moved on to the post-colonial Gothic. Which right shows us where the mode kind of comes in. We, we can see the mode living once we see these huge changes uh, occurring in what would have been a stable genre at that point. After that, we ended up touching on the big question, right? 
is everything gothic? And we concluded, yes, everything is. No, we concluded there's a whole bunch of associated genres, but you notice we left out a bunch as well. <laughs> so I think what we're saying is there's a lot of gothic out there. Not everything is gothic, but we will leave it up to you now to see where you can find the gothic in the literature that you read and particularly in soon because that's the text for this session unless you're watching this video with a replacement book which is also a possibility in which case please disregard all references to soon it's a book by lewis murphy that we are reading in this 2020 iteration of the course it might not be your gothic novel that just as a disclaimer have a, a nice uh, time, and we hope that you are going to do your required assignments. And we hope you have fun with them. Bye! <laughs>